Welcome to St Lawrence Church Winslow for our annual lecture. My name is Andrew Lightman and I am the Rector of the Winslow Benefice here in Buckinghamshire. This evening we are especially pleased to welcome the Right Reverend Dr Stephen Croft, the Bishop of Oxford, who will be giving our lecture. Bishop Stephen sits on the House of Lords Committee on Artificial Intelligence. I first heard Bishop Stephen speaking about artificial intelligence in 2017, and my interest was piqued. It was further piqued when I read a letter in a national newspaper where Bishop Stephen argued that artificial intelligence needs ethics. Artificial intelligence is a fast-moving phenomenon, and one which is and will continue to affect all of our lives. Artificial intelligence is both exciting and scary. We perhaps need to be alive to both its benefits and its dangers if we're going to flourish. This evening's lecture focuses on the ethical challenges that AI brings, but is also subtitled Human Flourishing in a Digital Age. Bishop Stephen will spend around 20 minutes giving us his thoughts and maybe laying down some challenges, and will then be joined by two further guests. Dr. Helen Saini works with Oxygen, Oxygen sorry, and her research interests are in the field of gene therapy, gene editing, and antibodies. Dr. Robert Brignall is a senior lecturer in mathematics at the Open University, and his research interests include the application of theoretical mathematics to computer science. Both Helen and Robert are members of our church community and have kindly, in that famous church word, volunteered to act as Bishop Stephen's conversation partners and perhaps even inquisitors. Stephen, Helen, Robert, we are delighted to have you here with us this evening for the St. Lawrence Lecture. Bishop Stephen, the floor is yours. That's when I first began to make a film with this. My uh, thinking and reflection was that this was something in the future. My mental image was of Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Terminator robot a general artificial intelligence in the future, uh, as it were, taking over the world. And uh, that image has changed. I'm no longer concerned about what might happen in a mythical or science fiction future. What keeps me awake at night in AI and data is what is happening now in the present. And my symbol is not actually a robotic figure from the future. It is my Tesco club card, my Sainsbury's nectar card, something many of us would carry now on our phones, which collects and harvests huge quantities of personal data and is able to use and deploy them in many different ways, often though we don't know. I want to look this evening at some of the issues that arise and are arising now in the present, they're not future issues, but with uh, the benefits and the harms that come through artificial intelligence. Uh, I was in a conference in Rome earlier this year, just before uh, Italy and then Britain locked down for COVID, uh, where the Vatican had convened a global coalition of tech firms and companies uh, to look at the benefits and the harms of artificial intelligence and a declaration was signed there by a number of different people, including Brad Smith, the chair of Microsoft, and eventually Pope Francis, which was a kind of covenant to preserve ethical AI, to make the most of the benefits, and to mitigate and to minimise the harms. Uh, a really important piece of work. Uh, the purpose of it summarised in Brad Smith's uh, major book, published at the end of uh, last year, called Tools and Weapons. Artificial intelligence is a potentially really important and helpful set of tools. Because it's so powerful, and the tools are so powerful, they can also be used for ill or have harmful consequences, often uh, accidentally. The benefits are huge in the field of medicine, in the fields of productivity, in the smoothing out and improving our decision making and in uh, improving the service that we all enjoy through technology. 
But these are some of the issues which have emerged along that journey and along that route. One is at the issue of public trust and confidence. The technology is being deployed very rapidly in ways which we, the members of the public, don't always understand and comprehend. There's a danger that the use of the technology will outstrip our trust and confidence in it, particularly if we discover afterwards, as it were, that our data has been put to uses which we didn't know and understand. The Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation has recently published the first edition of our AI Barometer, a survey of the whole field looking at what the main issues will be. One of its principal conclusions is that in order to have the maximum benefit from these technologies, we also need to husband very carefully public trust and confidence, and of course that means we need to be confident that technologies are being deployed in ethical ways. There are issues in the deployment of AI around public truth and political debate. Uh, we are just days away now from a United States presidential election, of which a huge amount is at stake for the United States and for the world. The debate is still raging about the role that social media and targeted advertising, driven by algorithms, played in the last US election, and as I mentioned at the beginning, in the Brexit referendum, and in elections all over the world. What are the rules and guidelines by which those technologies are deployed? Is it right to have private advertising, which is not publicly displayed, but which goes directly to people's phones and devices, and it's where, as it were, bombards us with points of view from one side of the debate only. What responsibility do Facebook and Twitter and the other social media companies have for the content which is carried in their media? At the moment, they are not accountable as publishers of books or newspapers are accountable for the stuff that they carry, and often it can do harm. There's a huge debate, I think, about artificial intelligence and the future of work. It's partly that AI and human beings will need to develop new partnerships, and some jobs will be created and some will be lost. It's likely that more jobs will be lost and created in this next wave of technological innovation, but perhaps not in, in as, as quickly or in as extreme way as is sometimes forecast. So that's one issue. How do we prepare people for what is a massive industrial revolution beginning to happen? The next industries to be affected will be call centres and warehousing and distribution, we're told. But there's a second issue which is emerging, and that's the proliferation of what is known as the gig economy, made possible by technology, uh, the delivery of meals to our doors, uh, the uh, ease of taking a ride in an Uber car instead of hailing a taxi, uh, warehousing which is driven by similar technology. All of those things seem good and convenient to those who use those services. But what are those industries like to work in? What is it like when your daily working life, all day, every day, is as it were controlled by an algorithm? Do we really want a world in which humans are working for robots, when actually what we imagine and what the science fiction has told us is that we would have a world in which robots did the labour on behalf of humanity. It may well be the other way round, unless we are active and vigilant. There's a whole set of issues around uh, data and bias and fairness in decision making. 
at the Centre for Data Ethics is shortly to publish a major survey on bias in algorithmic decision making, where we have worked with police forces, social services, the financial industry, and the human resources industry to look at the way algorithms are used in recruitment, in decisions about uh, children and social care, in decisions about predictive policing. How are those algorithms assessed to be fair? How do we balance the human and the machine component in decision making? What are the governments? Who is to blame when something goes wrong? We had a spectacular case over the summer of algorithms being used in A-level grade assessments and the government subsequently publicly blaming a mutant algorithm uh, for the decisions that were made. We need public engagement and public trust and confidence in all of those debates in a moment when the technology is accelerating. And the final issue uh, of perhaps another dozen I could mention, just to flag up, is the effect that technology is, happening, is ha having on our mental health, and especially the mental health of children and young people. Uh, Netflix itself, a tech company and a social media company, which uses algorithms to tell us what we might like to watch. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I published a new 90-minute, very powerful documentary called The Social Dilemma. It's a film which details the addictive and harmful consequences of social media on all our lives, but especially the lives of children and young people. Uh, data is being harvested and used and fed back to us and deployed in different ways. In a way that somehow erodes the boundaries of our personality and our mental health. And if you've seen the documentary, you'll see some of the really frightening statistics that, uh, and the way and the impact this is having on children and young people. All of the deployment of these technologies are really significant for our everyday lives. We need to learn how to live with the machines in new ways. And we need clear ethical principles by which to live with them and to govern them. The UK government has set out a vision that Britain should be the safest way, place in the world to go online. And the government has been somewhat tardy in bringing forward legislation to combat online harms. Clearly the pandemic this year has consumed a great deal of time and attention. But the UK is a subscriber to a high level set of principles for artificial intelligence, the OECD principles, which are, are really helpful in fleshing out the kind of ethics which should govern the deployment of these technologies. That AI should benefit people and the planet, uh, driving inclusive growth and sustainable development. AI systems should be designed in such a way that respects human rights and the rule of law. And there should be transparency and responsible disclosure. We should know when an AI is making decisions about our bank loan, or about a job that we might have applied for, or about our exam results. Uh, AI systems must function in a robust and secure and safe way. And organisations and individuals deploying artificial intelligence should be held accountable for their proper functioning in line with these principles. It's a rapidly developing field. And it's really important for all citizens uh, to share in uh, the debate around it. Quite often when I'm uh, sitting in meetings taking evidence or discussing these things and I meet 
uh, uh, people working in data science or uh, financial technology, uh, I can uh, see the thought bubble appearing out of their heads as they encounter uh, an Anglican bishop in the room. And the thought bubble kind of says, what are you doing here? What have you got to say about this? To which I say, well, I'm a citizen and this concerns all citizens. But I also say, I'm here representing a, a Christian faith. And at the heart of the Christian faith is the most wonderful and profound truth that Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, became a human person in Jesus Christ. And all of the questions, these deep ethical questions around the deployment of artificial intelligence and big data, all turn around the question of what it means to be human. And I am representing, in those conversations inadequately, a tradition of thinking and reflection on what it means to be human, which goes back to the beginnings of human civilization and 2,000 years of reflection on this truth and wonder that God became a human person. The Word became flesh and lived among us full of grace and truth. And I believe that as the Church, and as a Christian, we have something really important to contribute to this debate. Thanks for listening so far, and I really look forward to dialogue now with Helen and with Robert. So you can probably work out what he is from Andrew's introduction. I'm Dr. Robert Bigman, I hope you can hear me. And I'm um, Helen Saini, um, I think you can hear me too. And I continue to be here. <laughs> Well, so thank you for that. It's fascinating. There's lots of many facets to that, and uh, I did a little bit of programming for a pain, so, so it's been absolutely fascinating reading through this stuff. And, and there's really, it seems there's an awful lot which, you know, I don't think it's particularly necessarily very well known. There's all this sort of on the face of it stuff about data and, you know, how safe it's going to be. And so so um, but, but one that I find curious is this whole um, issue of bias, which you mm. And, and how algorithmic decision making, uh, you know, comes into things. And of course, you talk about the um, A-level results in the summer, which of course is a classic example, but not necessarily one that anybody would have thought of as necessarily as artificial intelligence. But that is essentially what any neural network is: is a is some kind of statistical training of a computer system. And of course, it introduced huge amounts of bias based on the on the data it was it was put on. You also mentioned public trust, and so here's a question. How many events like this A-level debacle that we had, can AI and this sort of technology survive um, before it becomes, you know, before, before the public lose trust in it? And what happens then? Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, that's a really good question. Um, one of the examples that was used quite a lot in, in the House of Lords Select Committee work uh, for the importance of public transfers, what happened over GM foods mm. uh, and um, uh, the loss of public confidence mm. in technological development that happened there. Uh, and I suppose there's a similar uh, risk in, in relation to vaccines as well. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, and so public trust remains really important for the benefits of, of science. Uh, my impression at the moment is that it's sector specific. Uh, uh, the use of algorithms and AI in decision making is now so widespread, it is beyond what mm -hmm. we normally think of. Um, uh, uh, and actually, it's likely to, to affect the loss of confidence in particular sectors. So because um, the, uh, the uh, exams did not go well in the summer, they'll be in really high scrutiny yes. of, of the subsequent use of algorithms in those decisions. But that may not necessarily affect public trust in the financial sector, where algorithms have been used to calculate credit scores and loans for some time. So I, I think it's in part sector specific, um, but it's a still developing field, uh, and it, public trust could collapse, I think, mm -hmm. um, in, any, in any one area, which, which would be a shame, 
But on the other hand, we need a high level of awareness and scrutiny as well. So, yeah. Now, do you want to alternate? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I have to say I knew very little about this subject before I uh, before I came here, so it was great to um, to, to hear to hear all about it. Um, I was really um, interested to hear about um, the work that you that you were doing, um, but to hear also that um, obviously there is still a way to go. Mm. Um, so I guess. I guess my question is, do you feel that you're being listened to? Um, and what do you feel um, is left to do? Thank, wow, time? that's a big question. Um, being, being listened to, um, uh, yeah, yes, not, not in the sense that I say what people should do and, and, and it happens. Um, but there, there is, I have found a huge appetite among the people developing the technology to broaden the conversation. Um, I, I've had several conversations in, in evidence-taking sessions where um, people have been saying to the panel of which I might have formed part, uh, you know, they're developing a particular uh, aspect of artificial intelligence or machine learning, and they're saying to the panel, you really need to understand how powerful this stuff is and how much it's going to change people's lives. Uh, and actually this, don't leave it to the scientists. Um, there is so much potential for change in this technology that we need a much bigger and wider public understanding and public debate. So, so I, I think that is really happening. Um, I think the government currently is seeking to balance, as all governments have to do, uh, um, the need for the ethical governance of data with the need for an environment in which innovation can flourish because our, our economy urgently needs innovation and regulation by some is thought to stifle that. So that's a very critical debate that's still to be settled. Um, and also the technologies are so new that we don't know how best to regulate them. Um, uh, and uh, I think the debate is now moving on from agreement about the high level principles to the specifics of how you have good governance, for example, if you're using algorithms and policing, mm -hmm. what are the safeguards that you need to build in? And it's becoming very uh, granular. Uh, I think the two areas that I'm most concerned about are, are um, uh, uh, digitization of work and the mental health of young people. The area I'm most hopeful about is, uh, is the deployment of AI, AI medical applications where there's an awful lot of groundwork has been done on the ethics of new technology and medicine anyway. So I think that's most secure. So, I mean, talking about innovation, and of course a lot of the things that have come along, you, you look at um, science fiction type things, and I was speaking to my father about this not so long ago, and he, uh, we talked about the um, Star Trek, where they have these things, they more or less predicted the mobile phone, mm. but they certainly didn't predict a mobile phone with a screen where you could see things and yeah. so on. You know, it was a glorified radio. Mm. Um, so, and, and there's also, you, you had a, a book which you mentioned, sort of these various books which look into the future mm. and so on. But of course, a lot of these things, the smartphone, for example, it's a piece of disruptive innovation. Mm. These things come from left of field and and they suddenly sweep over an awful lot, and none of us really predicted it, because by nature, these are the things that are hard to predict. Is, is this ethics framework going to be robust enough to the next extraordinary piece of innovation that comes along? Um, uh, uh, that's not something, I <laughs> not can, something you can answer, I can surely. Answer. But, so, so, uh, <laughs> but, but I think the stronger and better it is, um, the better prepared we will be, Perhaps, and the more yeah. aware we will be. Um, and I think, um, very interesting, um, when, when the Hazard Law Select Committee report was launched uh, a couple of years ago, Stephen Cave, who directs the, uh, one of the Cambridge centres for um, uh, 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 all of this tech research into technology, uh, quoted the mantra of uh, the tech industry in the 90s and the noughties, which was move fast and break things. Right. and pointed out very wisely and helpfully, I thought, that, that actually that's not good enough. Uh, and some of the things that can get broken, as we've seen, 
our law and democracy mm-hmm. and our whole way of life. Uh, and therefore, that disruption, I think governments are realising, mm-hmm. is not always a, a, a helpful way to innovate. Mm-hmm. It's much better to do it in a more steady and gradual way, mm-hmm. in a way that you're governing the technology. And, and once we've given away the rights to personal data, uh, or, for example, uh, the rights to Google to film our streets, uh, which is convenient for all of us, mm-hmm. but, but it's a tremendous invasion of our privacy. And those boundaries of privacy cannot then be pulled back. So I would say actually it's better to be cautious. And I think the more encouraging regimes in the world are actually in the European Union at the moment. Not the UK, because we're losing Mm -hmm. some of that protection. But in Germany and France, they're really being very robust uh, about the protection of personal data, which I think is right. I think you um, raised an interesting point there and you mentioned the word regimes. Mm. Um, I think we're very fortunate where we are um, in this part of the world, mm. but um, obviously there are other parts of the world that, that do not take data ethics nearly as seriously no. as we do. Um, what is your what is your view on these countries and, and where that leaves us? Um, there is an argument that we could be left behind mm. um, if they 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 can just continue to, to develop the technologies and, and we're we're pulling back. Yeah. But at the same time, um, there is a. There is an argument that, um, well, it's an argument for humanity, really, and mm. what does that mean for, for those yeah. people? Yeah. I, I think we need to be very, very aware of that. Uh, um, that If you look at investment in uh, AI and data-driven technologies globally, uh, then um, the two largest blocks of investment by far are, are Silicon Valley and the American tech companies, which are governed by a very libertarian uh, 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 foundation, uh, 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 the consumer and the individual uh, drives it, uh, and uh, the Chinese companies, which are governed by the opposite set of ethics. Um, and there is a fright, for me, as a, uh, somebody brought up in a Western democracy, a, a truly chilling connection of data and personal control uh, beginning to emerge in China, uh, which I think is deeply worrying. And I think we have to be very circumspect about what is happening and aware of it, uh, and actually to combat it. I think the um, data protection regimes and the governance of these technologies in Europe, with its uh, Christian and Enlightenment values on, on the role of humanity and human society, represents a real point of hope. But it is a smaller player even as a whole of Europe in the global investment scene. But I, but I think a lot of the creative ideas are coming from the European Union and from our own government, actually, in the need to govern these technologies, perhaps because we sit outside those two great systems. But we've seen that, we've seen that debate going on in the debate around Huawei and the 5G technology and what else do we take on board if we take on board infrastructure? Yeah, so um, if we go to uh, examples like a Tesco club card, which I'm not sure if people <laughs> at home actually heard that bit or not, but it's a fine example and an early example of, of us quite liberally giving away our data to this company. Uh, and and while we might feel that, that Tesco and Sainsbury's or wherever you, wherever you shop, although supermarkets are available, <laughs> um, uh, you find that that's, that's an acceptable amount of data to give away and you know, maybe they, you trust these companies to look after them. Hopefully you also trust the infrastructures which mm. they're working on as well. But then there are going to be those people who feel more risk averse or they learn. In fact, they, they learn the fact that these companies, even if it's, it's a reasonably trustworthy company, you learn that they are uh, doing this sort of stuff with your data and then predicting what you might like to buy, that's a bit scary. Mm-hmm. It's a bit scary for quite a lot of people. I mean, it's, it's probably a bit scary for all of us, if we're honest. But for some people, that's so scary that they then shirk away from it. Mm-hmm. But then you miss out on your club card points and mm-hmm. you miss out on things and you end up paying more mm-hmm. for your shopping than other people. So 
you end up with these people, and this is a, perhaps a trivial example, but you will have people who are left behind mm -hmm. from, from all of this technology. And, and as things move forward, there may be this growing group of people, I mean, maybe this comes back to public trust again, but it's actually sort of maybe, it, it, it's, not a, it's not a sort of average in global level, but actually the individuals who, mm -hmm. who decide to go away from this, and they're going to miss out. Is there anything we can do to, to reassure them or to, uh, you know, at least give them some reassurance that, that some of these systems at least are okay? And, and sure, these things are predicting, but somehow explain to them why it is that this isn't, this isn't such a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, think, I think there's quite a lot that could be done. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I think uh, there's quite a lot of levelling up is needed, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, Technology has been fantastic through um, the pandemic by and large, and certainly for churches it's sure. been yeah. uh, amazing, and for many businesses as well. Um, but there's been great inequalities, particularly in access to technology in rural communities, uh, and mm -hmm. where children have needed to do homeschooling, which is for all children for a certain length of time, and some children still now, um, a, great a greater inequality mm. introduced by poverty if people don't have access to broadband in the home, if they don't have access to laptops and uh, iPads and, and so on in the home and don't have adults around who can help them to use the technology. And so it's absolutely vital that uh, central and local government intervene mm. to make sure there's a level playing field and platform. Uh, and I, I think we need a much greater emphasis on public information and education. I don't think we can leave that to the market uh, 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 in order to build this uh, public trust and confidence, really. Mm. Uh, it, it's absolutely essential. I mean, everybody's mind at the moment, of course, is on, <laughs> is on the present and, and COVID. Um, but in a curious kind of way, I, I, I hope that the Track and Trace app works really well because it will, mm. it will be a positive use of technology which is genuinely helpful and which is simple to use and is also governed by a reasonably straightforward data regime as well, which isn't storing lots of personal data. Do you see the positives in, in, in this? What are the main positives that you see of the technology? Because it's, it's so easy to, to focus on the, on the negatives. Yeah. And I know, you know, as a scientist myself, um, myself and my colleagues, you know, when we... Uh, interventions uh, mm. you know, developing new, new technologies um, scientists develop things for the greater good um, yeah, and yeah. unfortunately it's in the hands of the wrong people that it, that's when it goes horribly wrong but you'll find that most scientists are very genuine and yeah, um, yeah. really want you know are developing these technologies because they want to see an improvement um, so do you do you see um, humanity do you see the benefits to humanity of AI as well? Um, yeah, yes, huge. Uh, I, I think they're easiest to see in in uh, in the medical field. And um, the conference I uh, I went to at the Vatican that I referred to uh, earlier had some amazing presentations about the developments in uh, uh, particularly testing for cancer. So so the ability uh, the ability to to read um, uh, X-rays and scans very very quickly in partnership with a human radiographer is, is quite well known now. But what I didn't know was the ability to scan tiny droplets of blood for a, a cancer prediction, which will remove the need for invasive tests and, and make testing much more widely available, which is one of the surest routes for uh, defeating cancer and minimizing risk. And, and the doctor who presented that uh, to the conference said, the benefits of this are so great, it would be, I think he used the word sinful, not to uh, use it. But in order to use it, we need the ethical framework to govern it. Uh, there was a fascinating uh, a BBC documentary last year, I think, on Babylon Health, which is uh, remote GP practices, uh, which raised questions about the way it was being used in the UK because the thought was it might disadvantaged poorer communities by creaming off wealthier patients who could afford technology. But, but when they switched their documentary to Rwanda and the way uh, GP access was being rolled out in remote African rural communities, 
everybody saw instantly how amazing this was going to be. Uh, and the same way with uh, sensor devices on the human body and healthcare uh, benefits are, are absolutely huge. But they, they need to be governed wisely and healthcare data and the use of our personal data in healthcare is one of the most important areas to develop robust systems and public trust. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's quite interesting. And you, you sort of, you mentioned earlier about sort of mental health and mm. so on. And actually, one of the one of the problems with some of this is perhaps you have reduced contact. You know, we're social we're social animals. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I was reading a book earlier on this year, and there's there's a thing called the default network in your brain, which is what your brain does when it's not doing anything else. Mm. And there's at least now some theories which say that. Uh, uh, this, what it's actually doing is it's reenacting and it's working through all the social interactions you've had. Basically, when your brain's not doing anything else, it's thinking about how you mix in with the rest mm. of society. Um, and, and so, you know, this, these possibilities for remote GPs and so on in, in places like Rwanda, you can see that the, the benefits are, are, are extraordinary. And in fact, the benefits are probably extraordinary here as well. But then that's possibly one fewer social interactions we might be having. Mm. And maybe with your GP, that's maybe not, not you know, <laughs> it's not necessarily that you want to go to the GP anyway. But then, you know, you go to the supermarket mm. and you no longer, maybe it's the only person you're going to interact with all day. Uh, and it turns out that they're actually a machine which is telling you off because you put your handbag in the wrong place or whatever. Um, so can we, you know, can, can, uh, I guess, and this really is around maybe to sort of mental health type issues, which where clearly the, the risks are, are, are there, but let's, let's turn this positive. I wonder if there's anything that AI can do in terms of being, giving an advantage towards tackling mental health. Is that, do you know anything? <laughs> this is a... <laughs> That's a really interesting uh, question. Um, I think, I, no, I, I uh, well, well there, there are some things I'm not particularly um, enamoured of, but there are, but there are, um, com there are chatbot uh, counselling programs right. yep. um, which can be accessed, um, uh, where, where somebody is talking to a machine mm -hmm. which is giving them therapy on a cognitive behavioural therapy model or some other counselling model. And the machine does say from time to time, please remember I'm only a robot, mm -hmm. you know, I can't answer that question. Um, but but it, is, it is an attempt to intervene in mental health. Um, the other, the other in intervention is, is the use of, um, there's quite a lot of use of care robots in, in Japanese mm -hmm. social care now. Mm -hmm. And uh, counterintuitively, uh, it seems to affect people's mental and emotional well-being positively. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a bit of an extrapolation from ha having a pet, I guess. You know. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, uh, people don't feel so alone uh, with, um, uh, with uh, robots present. Um, so, so I think we'll need to watch and monitor those things. There might be some surprising things, really. But, but I, I think... Um, the importance of asserting human agency in our control over the use of technology is, is really, really important. There's quite a move now, um, started from a reinvention of the Jewish Sabbath idea of people having a tech-free day once a week mm -hmm. uh, from Friday evening to Saturday evening, where they don't look at screens. Uh, and one of my daughters has just started doing it, and, and she's been amazed at the difference it has made to, to her family life mm -hmm. uh, and her sense of time and also the number of things that she depends on her phone for yep. in the course of a day. So I think that's a really interesting positive mental health development, <laughs> reacting against the yes. trend. Yeah. I've got another positive one as yeah. well, um, going back to the, um, you know, the lockdown. Um, I don't know if you found this, but I certainly found that WhatsApp, my, my WhatsApp usage increased tremendously. Yeah. People that I couldn't actually see because we were, we were not supposed to go out. Mm. Um, we were still able to keep, keep yeah. in contact because of WhatsApp. Yeah. And 
even my mum, who you know refused to have a mobile phone for years and years, um, she managed to get one just before lockdown, and she yeah. said, "It's it, I wouldn't have survived without no, my, no, without no, WhatsApp." No, no, so no. you know, being in touch with all these people, um, and suddenly people contacting friends and family mm. that they hadn't spoken to for a long time, and mm. that that real human need yeah. to yeah. have contact. Yeah. But the technology being there uh, and enabling that yeah, contact yeah, in a situation yeah. where you couldn't actually meet face to face, I thought that was quite, quite interesting. Um, having said that, I have two children myself, and I must say that I am concerned about um, the use of social media. Yeah. So I guess you know one of the questions that um, that I had for you is. What do you think that we can be doing, you know, as parents and as a society, mm. to protect our children from um, from the dangers of, um, of AI? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I think um, we need to be really careful about um, the age at which children have access to smartphones. Really, there's tremendous pressure um, on parents to. Um, uh, to give their children smartphones from quite an early age, but but I I would say the later the better for smartphones. I th I think a mobile phone which can make and receive calls, which isn't a smartphone, it is a you know, it's a helpful thing for you know for parents to keep in touch with their children and for use in emergencies. But but in placing a smartphone into into a child's hand for use unsupervised, I, I think they they need to be you know mid I would say mid teens really. I'm very thankful I don't have to parent my own children in the age of the smartphone, really. I shall watch how my children do it with their children with interest when they get to that age. Um, and, and also um, building resilience in them, um, because I think the, um, what, what the technology and social media does is create a, a, a panopticon, a complete circle of being known and exposed 24-7, uh, uh, okay. and without the fostering of identity, and during the teenage years when uh, when your identity is is finding itself, it, it's extremely challenging, really. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, yeah, I, I would be very cautious, and therefore, pe it's really hard. And um, if my wife was here, she would interject at this point and say, "I'm not taking my own medicine." But. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Uh, parents modelling, not consulting their social media all the time and having their phones at the dinner table and all the other things we do. I think there's a lot we have to learn in my generation and, uh, and others about living well with this technology and in charge of it. So. Yeah, I mean, we have a we have a rule that's no phones at the table. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's that, that's a, a rule that we occasionally get told off by our children for, yeah, for breaking yeah. occasionally. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and actually, interesting. I, I took last Lent. I gave up social media, mm. which was possibly not the best year to do it now in hindsight, um, <laughs> given given what then happened. Yeah. I mean. We, I kept WhatsApp and, and various things because there were various sort of channels of communication there that are important. Um, and actually, it was it was fascinating because I, I gave it up as part of a sort of uh, a, a book I was reading on on sort of becoming, you know, living with digital mm. type stuff, mm. um, but living with it in a way that you you carefully curate which bits you let into your lives. Mm. Uh, and anything that is just a distraction, you, you get rid of, mm. and you only keep the things that are actually sort of useful mm. or, or are giving you a genuine positive advantage. Mm. And that seems like quite a good way to, to go forward, um, where you can you can keep these those particular parts. Mm. But it also adjusted my my way of interacting in sort of social media and so on. You know, there's that like button on Facebook, mm. which I was very tempted to to press, and most other um, social media sites have something similar, uh, and. And the, this book had something which said, "Don't click like." You know, if you if you genuinely like something, then say it. Don't don't mm. liking is the clicking like is a sort of minimum thing you could do. Yeah. it's the absolute smallest piece of social interaction you can possibly have with that mm. particular mm. thing. Mm. Uh, and maybe sometimes that's fine. You know, if it's just like a oh great, you know, that's that is sort of the equivalent of clicking like. Mm. But but actually write something underneath. Say congratulations or whatever it is that yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. Interact with that post because otherwise, what are we doing? We're reducing our social interaction, mm. and and you have these wonderful 
ability on Facebook and all these other social media sites of interacting with hundreds more people than we normally mm. do. Mm. Uh, and so it would be really sort of, I don't know, somehow, um, you know, just being able to to make sure that you can take the advantage of that without then just reducing the social interaction. So yeah, yeah, yeah. seems somehow yeah. quite important. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, I agree. Mm. It's fantastic. Yes. And, and, uh, that's, and, it's, and I have to say, having done loads and loads of Zoom calls, it's really lovely to interact with yeah. people face that's to right. face this evening. I've really enjoyed <laughs> the conversation. And I hope some of it's come through to people watching at home and uh, uh, please, you know, be very patient with the technology glitches. It can and often does go wrong. I think that the last thing I want to say on, on the subject is one of the things that uh, is really has, has brought home to me through through engaging with artificial intelligence. Really interesting, though the technology is amazing. Though some of it can be compared to computers when I was um, uh, uh, growing up, is. Um, even the most advanced artificial intelligence is as nothing compared to what it means to be a human person. And actually, you could almost say it's a misnomer. Uh, it, it's not quite what we mean by human intelligence. And human beings are, in the words of the psalmist, fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, awe-inspiring, really. From a young baby to the oldest person that you know, Human beings are endlessly fascinating and, as Christians, we believe, made in the image and likeness of God. And you can go on exploring what it means to be human uh, for the whole of your life and still find new things. So uh, let's enjoy the technology uh, and let's use it well and wisely for the good of humanity. But let's celebrate that human persons are fearfully and wonderfully made and made in the image of God. And thank you for watching, and I don't know if Andrew wants a final word. I just wanted to say thank you to you all for being here this evening for an enlivening conversation, for um, bringing you know, your disciplines together. So maths meets biology, broadly speaking, meets theology. You know, all of these things have a great contribution to make to what it means to be human. And a special thanks to Bishop Stephen. And I do think our final photo should be of his wonderful new robot, which was bought in our new St. Lawrence shop, even before it's opened. It's an <laughs> old-fashioned Meccano robot, which just goes to show that some toys never go out of fashion, whatever happens with technology. So I don't think we can make the Meccano robot wave, but <laughs> if we could, he would. We can. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much, Bishop Stephen, Helen, Robert.